Hi guys, this is Rohit and today we are going to talk about EDA or uh, Exploratory Data Analysis or whatever it is called. The idea is this that why is this important, right? That's that's the first point where we begin our lecture. Why do we want to even do EDA, right? That's why do we want to do this whole exploratory data analysis? So as it turns out that EDA is probably one of the very important things um, that is supposedly uh, that's not given a lot of importance in a data scientist kind of journey of things. But it's actually something that is very, very, very critical to the kind of job that you're doing, right? So EDA is basically kind of, you know, getting your hands dirty with the data. So all of this whole thing that we have talked about, you know, you kind of start with model building. We have talked about linear regression. We uh, talked about so many different model building methods and everything that we have talked about as of in the sessions, all of the sessions that we have talked and all the sessions we are going to talk, right? EDA is something that is absolutely critical in the middle of all of this. It's not something at all tough, right? So this is something which is very, very, very basic. There's nothing about it, but yet it's something that is extremely critical to the entire journey of data science. Now, why is this critical? So EDA is basically the part where you kind of take the data and visualize things, right? Now, why is visualization so important? That's exactly what we are going to learn today, right? So we are just going to learn different techniques of visualizations and all of that. So first to understand why do we even need to do visualizations? That's something that is very critical to understand. And that's because when you're kind of looking at visualizations, it's from only visualizations that you would be able to infer things. For example, in case of linear regression, we understood that, uh, hey, sales price is the target variable. And I think a good indicator variable would be independent variable, sorry, would be living area, right? So how did we even come up with that conclusion? Now, obviously, back of your mind, you probably already know this, that yeah, living area is something that is probably proportional to sales price. But then that's something, that whole understanding of that, concept right that it's something that is related to living area living area is related to sales price is something that you kind of uh, only can gather for in case of data sets where you're familiar with what the independent and dependent variables are you can kind of take a guess but in most other cases where you're not familiar with the data set right or you really do not know where to start right which are the features that are important which are features which are not important those are the cases where you should start off with EDA first and kind of get a feel of the data, right? So that's what I always tell people, right? EDA is basically kind of getting a feel of the data. That's if you the word you use, right? Just kind of get and see how the data looks like, you know, get a get an idea of it. That, that's the start place you start off. You do not start off the first day uh, you know, when you get a data science problem. You do not start off with kind of doing your model building. You do not start off with outlier detection. You do not start off with your uh, inferential stats, all of those, right? You start off with just basic thing, which is get a feel of the data, right? And that's exactly what EDA is, right? So, EDA, the objective of EDA is basically simple, right? So, for example, in this case, right, to so discover patterns, which is something that I've talked about. You have to spot anomalies, you have to frame your hypothesis, and then you have to check your assumptions, right? So this is exactly, these are the four major, major understanding of why you should do EDA, right? So discover patterns is basically you kind of figure out that, hey, this, this, is, this is a pattern out there. There's probably something that I can, if I build a model machine learning algorithm to kind of pick up this pattern, that's something that is going to be helpful, right? So picking up patterns in, you know, you know, in also in picking up patterns, say, with respect to how the variable behaves, right? So say if it's a time series kind of a data, then you would see how the variable behaves at different spots in time, right? If there's a yearly trend, if there's a monthly trend, so all of those kind of pattern analysis, spotting anomalies, right? Which is basically spotting if there's an if there's a, there's an outlier in the data and all of those things. So again, you have to use visualization. You do not necessarily have to use visualization, but visualization can be a very important technique. Then there is frame hypothesis, which is something that I've already talked about, which is basically framing your problem, right? That this is something that I want to predict using this all features, right? So that all understanding is something that you gain out of EDA. And then finally, check assumptions, right? Which is basically uh, that you have an idea that this is probably something that is happening and uh, you have already, but you want to kind of validate your truth, right? So that's why you want to use EDA. So that's our understanding. That's why we are out here. We are taking, doing this session right now. So program so far, we have talked about Python data science box. We have talked about machine learning, intro to machine learning, uh, summarizing the data, statistical inference. We have talked about linear regression. We have talked about all of this. Um, from all of this, I would say if you're not familiar with uh, Python, we are not a good place to kind of start your journey right now. But if you're familiar with Python, rest of the things, uh, it's okay if you don't kind of get the full on picture of it. It's perfectly fine for this sessions, but for next sessions, I would highly recommend you kind of get familiar with those ideas. 
But for this session, see fine with Python, we are perfectly, absolutely good to go ahead in this session. So what are we going to learn today? First is initial exploration, which is the exploration, exploration, which is just kind of seeing the, you know, basic, basic things about hygiene checks of sorts. Then we are going to talk about introduction to C1, which is a library. Uh, in that library, we are going to use that library for two things, univariate and multivariate analysis. So that's, that's, the, that's the agenda for the today. Now let's first start with John's initial exploration. So now that John had tested all the factors affecting the price of a house using inferential stats, he wants to get a better understanding of his data set. Fair enough. So after a bit of research, he raised that he will have to separate uh, different rows and columns to kind of get a bigger picture. So he starts off by importing all the libraries, then he starts with reading the data, right? So this is something that you're familiar with. So it's always a good idea to take a closer look at the data itself. So with the help of head and tail functions of the library, we can use it easily check out the first and few lines of the data frame, right? So head and then you can pass the number of rows you want to view. So in this case, if you pass head and you pass five, you get to see the first five rows. If you pass 10, you get to see the first 10 rows. Similarly, you do dot tail and you can see, and in tail also you can pass number of rows that you want to see the last five rows, last 10 rows, similarly, right? So that's the first place, right? Uh, so you get to see the last 10, five rows here. You get to see the last five rows here. And now it's also good practice to know the columns and the corresponding data types along with finding out whether they have contained null value or not, right? So the next part is basically getting an idea of uh, if there are, what are the kind of, you know, data types that are there in each of the columns. That's the next part of exploration. And if there are null values or not. So in all we know that this basically, this data frame basically has 1460 entries. Uh, starting from index 0 to 1459 and we can see that all of the columns basically have 1460 null, non-null objects except probably in this case we start seeing garage year build has 1379 non-null objects so basically garage year build has some null objects and similarly but apart from that I think the rest of the every of the column basically has 1460 non-null objects right so they are all filled uh, or do, don't have a NAN except for this particular column which is garage year build so now how do we uh, do this is we use this function called describe which basically helps us to get various summary statistics that exclude NAND values right so the summary statistics account mean standard deviation so basically if you do dot data frame dot describe it gives you the different columns and their corresponding uh, statistics like count mean standard deviation minimum 25th percentile 50th percentile 75th percentile max all of that right so that's all you get to see here in this, right? So uh, each for each column, you get to get the corresponding value. So this is a very extremely, I would say, helpful technique, right? So if, you, if you're just not having any idea where to start off, right? How the data frames of each of them look like. This is a very good place to start off, right? You just do data frame not describe. That at least gives you an idea of how the data looks like, right? So what is the, what is the range in which it is varying and all of that. So. Yeah, to get a feel of the data, this is the right place to start up, right? So you do data frame dot describe. So you can also do data frame dot shape. That is your pandas basic commands. You know that already. So you do 1460 cross 80. So that means there are 1460 rows and 80 columns. Now, how to find the numerical features of a data set? So numerical features are those data sets which are basically uh, you can basically use uh, data frame dot underscore get numeric data, right? So get numeric data is basically nothing but it figures out all the data columns which have got the data types in 64, float 64, all of those, right? So basically any data, any column which has got your data type of the form in 64, in 16, float 64, float 16, all of those types, right? Are basically your numeric data columns, right? And that's exactly what it does here. So data frame dot underscore get numeric data gives you all the data uh, columns right along with the rows which have got numeric data right so and then once you do dot columns it gives you the list of all the columns in those data in the data frame which has just got numeric data right and then if you do that you get the data frames in the columns which have got numeric data right so lot frontage lot area etc so now that's your way to underscore get numeric data was a way to get your numeric feature how do you get your categorical features so categorical features is basically all those columns which are not numeric columns, right? So that's exactly what we do here. So we get the all the set of columns that are there. And from that, we subtract all the columns which are basically numeric columns, right? 
and then all columns which are not numeric are basically your categorical features and then you see the list of all them right so that's about it so now that we understood john understood how to kind of do numeric versus categorical differentiation the next part for john was to get introduced to cbon so cbon is an extremely uh, helpful library uh, for doing all of this visualizations it's a it's a very nice it's a very uh, pretty library i would say a matplotlib is the one that you normally use and that's something that even i use for most of my activities but then it's it's those cases where you say want to kind of build very beautiful graphs uh, show it for your presentation ppts or you want to kind of do it for your business slides whatever it is basically when you want to do very beautiful graphs that's the reason why you would want to use cbon uh using c1 also by the way also has gives you advantage of doing some uh slightly more added uh i would say added functionalities for computing much better describing graphs rather than matplotlib so that's also another beautiful advantage of c1 so all in all yeah if you are if you are kind of looking for exquisite data analysis with you know, visually appealing charts c1 is a library that you should go for So now John wanted to analyze his data, and when I say analyze, more like visualize his data. Uh, so John has John is now trying to get started into using C1. So what is C1? I've already told you it's a visual Python visualization library based on Matplotlib, uh, and very attractive features, right? Very very nice features. Uh, several built-in themes. So basically anything. I don't want to do the marketing pitch for C1, but it's it's definitely definitely a very good library if it comes to better visualizations. So more functionalities and all of that. So first you import C1. Uh, once you import C1, C1, and then uh, there are two kinds of analysis that you can do. One is univariate analysis. The other is multivariate analysis. So univariate analysis is very simple, where you are kind of just looking at one variable at a time and looking at entire distribution and visually seeing how that entire variable looks like. Right? So basically histograms and all of those kind of things. We are just concerned with one variable, right? So living area at a time. We are not looking how living area is varying with respect to sales price. You are just looking at living area and seeing how living area is varying, right? So that's the idea. So univariate analysis. So numeric univariate analysis can be done both for numerical features as well as categorical features. So first let's look at numerical features for univariate analysis. Numeric variable obviously the basic one is histogram. So we have already talked about this histogram. Uh, I think we have talked about it descriptive stats. So what is a histogram? So when dealing with a set of data often the first thing that you want to do in numeric features is basically kind of plot a histogram and histogram is nothing but a set of bins, right? So there are different buckets. You basically Split the entire data into hundred, two hundred, ten, whatever number of buckets you want to. And once you divide your data into buckets, then you basically see how many data observations fall into each bucket, right? So if you are trying to do living area or the sales price, you and your sales price varies from hundred thousand to two sixty thousand. You basically split them into say buckets of ten, hundred to hundred and ten thousand, hundred and ten thousand to hundred and twenty thousand, right? And you see a number of houses which have houses between. Uh, prices between hundred to hundred and ten thousand. Then see number of houses between the hundred and ten to hundred and twenty. And number based on number the frequency of houses in each of the bucket, your height of the bar is basically the same thing, right? So your height of bar in each bin is basically the number of houses in that bin. So now we do our random. Uh, so so this is a random normal distribution with size equals to hundred. So what we did was basically we have already you know already what is the standard normal distribution. So we took basically just hundred samples out of a normal standard normal distribution, hundred random values, and uh, we tried plotting their uh, histogram. This is how the histogram looks like. In order to make any prediction, John knows that to in order to fit a linear regression, he has to make sure that the data is linear, right? So how would he do that? So to check for that, he basically checked if the data in the columns that he is trying to use as independent variables. Is there a skewness or is there a outlier in the data, right? So we have known already from a linear regression knowledge that uh, skewness is something or outliers is something that is going to affect our results adversely, right? So that's exactly what he tries to plot here. So these are the different histograms for year bill, total basement area, sales price, and grid living area. So obviously you can see that there's a, there's a lot of skewness in year bill. uh we have more houses from current periods and houses from earlier periods a uh, living area also there's a, there's a sort of skewness similarly sort of skewness for sales price as well uh 
but yeah the sales the skewness for all of total basement area sales price living area are fine but you can see the skewness for year build is absolutely bad right it's it's extremely skewed to the right right it's not a centrally symmetric distribution so that's something that you can see here so now from that you can uh, this is this is interesting concept called kernel density estimation so what you have in case when you plotting histogram is basically you have uh, a discrete function right for each bin you have the corresponding frequency for each bin you have the corresponding frequency right so your frequencies are being discretized in different bins right so you do not know what is the exact frequency at a given point right so to do that you need something which is a continuous function and that's exactly what kernel density estimation does so kernel density estimation basically fits a continuous curve on top of your histogram which is a discrete point right so in this case for example uh, say year built right so in year built you would not say for year 1951 you do not have the exact number of houses built right you can obviously calculate that uh, but say for any 1951 and month of january right you do not have the exact number of houses built so to do that you need something if you want to get an information an approximation of that sort that's why you need a kde curve because this histogram just says the number of houses which are built between 1940 to 1950 right or 1950 to 1960 and it just basically has that amount of info now if you want to know at any exact point in time 1950 january how many houses were there you do not know and the only way you can kind of get that so because that's point is that uh, you have for that you basically need a function a value for every point right which is basically varying so for every point in time you would need a separate value for example similarly in case of this graph of basement area in case of basement area you do not know what is the number of houses with exact basement area say 3000 and 3000.5 or 3000.1 or 3002 uh, square foot right so you do not know what is the area with exact at any given point at any given point you can only say that hey within this range this is the range in which it varies that's the problem with histogram that's why you need a curve which kind of smoothly varies so that at any point you can kind of get an idea of the frequency right so that's what exactly kde does kde helps you fit a continuous function on top of this discretized bins discretized bins the problem i have already kind of told you repeatedly is that you cannot get a value for a function which is lying in the bucket right or for any value for you cannot get a singular value you can always say that within this range these are the number of houses right but at any particular point in uh, that range you cannot have the number of houses for that value right so that's why you need something which is smooth and which kind of varies across different values of time right so that's the reason why we need to have a, a kernel density estimation function now how does kernel density estimation works it's a basically a very rigorous unsupervised technique that i would ask and uh, request you to kind of have a look at at a more detailed look at later on uh, that's not part of the curriculum right now but it's it's a very nice uh, example of an unsupervised machine learning approach uh, so now box plots box plots what are box plots box plots are something that we have again talked about in uh, when we talked about um descriptive stats is basically nothing but a plot which basically box plot whisker plots whatever you call it is basically this where you have the middle line which is the median and then the box lies between your first quartile to third quartile and on the left hand side you basically have on the left of basically left or below however which axis you view doesn't matter basically on one side you have the 1.7 1.75 yeah right yeah so q1 minus 1.75 iqr 1.5 i think yeah q1 minus 1.5 iqr and q3 plus 1.5 iqr so between those are the two values that you see these bars are and basically any values which are greater than those values are shown as dots which are basically the outlier values right according to the definition of outliers as values which lie outside this uh, range right so that's using that as a definition for outlier these are the outliers that you can see here right so again going over so this is the extreme most value on the left is q1 minus 1.5 iqr then you have q1 and there's a blue box which lies between q1 and q3 and the middle most the line in between is q2 which is the median and on this side this is q3 plus 1.5 iqr and then on the value to on the right hand side of that is basically the outliers right anything which basically doesn't fall in this range is called an outlier 
so that is that is about box plot so we have already talked about minimum first quarter so those are the different so box plot is essentially very intuitively helpful as compared to histogram is basically if you want if you are concerned about getting the iqr the median and the mode and all of those kind of things if you are trying to do all of those interquartile range it's very helpful if you use box plots so more about box plot so we have already talked about the 3 into iqr which is basically q1 minus 1.5 iqr and Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. So those those basically kind of constitutes your uh, within that range, right? So anything which falls outside of those ranges are normally termed as outliers. So in this case, we are again plotting different things like year build, total basement area, total living area, and all of those things, and we are seeing what are the different box plots for each of them, right? So only thing that you kind of note here is that. Uh, total basement area has got not a lot of outliers. Yeah, there are this this one particular outlier that you can see here. But apart from that, not a lot of outliers. In case of year built, also you see that there are some outliers. Uh, obviously, to a lower end, right? So 18, 80, and anything on that side is probably an outlier. Uh, on the other hand side, there are a lot of outliers. It seems on greater living living area and sales price because. Uh, uh, there are there are a lot of values which are out of that three three IQR range, right? So that's one thing that we kind of can understand from this particular distribution. Log on to Grey Atoms Learning Platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.